I'm Juliana Stevenson, and happy Black History Month. Thank you for joining the Emporia State University Special Collection Archive Department in celebrating Emporia's Black educators by examining the history of Black education in both Emporia and Kansas through notable events and people. Their past help to shape our future. Now let us get started with Education for Kansas prior to 1896. In 1861, the Kansas State Constitution did not address segregation. Therefore, Kansas law did not require segregated schools. Those decisions were left to local governments and school districts. Some counties and townships allowed integration, but others opposed it. Because of this, the early to mid 1860s made Kansas a mixed bag of equality. Peter Regard, one of Kansas's first superintendents of public instruction, wholeheartedly opposed segregated schools. In 1867, Kansas state law allowed for segregated schools, but not separate schools for black students. Public school boards reacted to this by denying black students enrollment in a public school. This led to a situation that conflicted with the equality opportunity set in the 14th Amendment. In 1874, school boards were reprimanded by the state for not allowing students to enroll in public school based on their race. This resulted in the practice of closing mixed public schools and opening white only private schools. As a result of the end of the Reconstruction period, the Ku Klux Klan gaining prominence in Kansas and the Exodusters added to a growing black population in the state. Kansas society changed its attitude and many began to favor segregation. In 1879, the Kansas legislature passed laws allowing first-class cities to segregate elementary and middle schools. These laws remained until 1950. This law and the rights given in the 13th and 14th Amendments led to school segregation being challenged. In the case of Elijah Tennant versus the Board of Education of Ottawa are a good example. The first case happened in May 1880. Because the Ottawa School Board placed all the Black students no matter the grade level in a single classroom, the segregated students were not provided with equally qualified teachers and given inadequate materials. Tid ensued. This conclusion of this first case resulted in Black students being placed into appropriate grade levels and provided with proper school materials. Then, in July 1881, the Ottawa Board of Education sought to address the problem of class overcrowding by segregating the Black and white students. Once again, all the Black students, no matter their grade level, were moved to a small two-room schoolhouse across the street from the main building. Tennant argued for his son to be admitted to the white only school due to being closer to home. Once again, he sued for equal opportunity for his son and won the case. In 1891, Knox versus the Board of Education of Independence used the 1879 first class city law as a space argument. The case argued that, in, that the Independence Board of Education had no right to deny Lilia and Bertha Knox, two black children, the right to attend the white school. Only due to the fact that Independence was not a first class city and did not have legal right to segregate, the Knox would go on to win this case. Many more of these small town integration case, cases would happen all over Kansas in battle for the segregating schools. Then, in 1896, a specialty case would enter the Supreme Court and become a major hindrance to the fight for equal opportunity. Plessy versus Ferguson. 1896. The outcome of separate but equal in a Supreme Court case of Plessy v. Ferguson will become the lawful argument used to justify segregation throughout the nation. This case starts in 1890 when the Louisiana legislature passed a separate car act, mandating that all railroad cars either be completely separate or segregated by race. A collection of Black citizens that call themselves the Citizens Committee vocally opposed this and sent Homer Plessley to challenge the law. On June 7, 1892, Homer Plessley, a mixed race man, sat in the first class whites only car of the East Louisiana Railroad. He was caught by the conductor and arrested for violating the law. Plessy, who backed from the Citizens Committee, challenged his charge until they reached the Supreme Court. His petition argued that the segregation laws set by the Louisiana violated his federal rights set by the 13th and 14th Amendments. 
His case continued through processing and trial until May 18, 1896, when the final verdict was given. The Supreme Court's verdict declared that it would deny the challenge set by Plessy and the Citizens Committee, voting in favor of the state in its discriminatory segregation laws. The major opinion of the court was given by Justice Henry Billings Brown and quotes the reasoning for the withholding verdict to be, the object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a humbling of the two races upon terms un unsatisfactory to either. For the next 60 years, this verdict would be based for the separate but equal doctrine that provided federal law and legal support to any arguments or case brought up on the subject of segregation. This ruling was stand until 1954, when the Brown versus Board of Education of the PICA overturned the ruling. This ruling supported segregation, a segregation that affected even those who wanted to be teachers. Paul Terry, born October 15, 1916, and passing in March 25, 2005. Paul Terry led a groundbreaking life. He helped to integrate high school sports in Kansas by playing on the Emporia High School basketball team. Because of the prevalent racism, not all were accepting that Terry joined the team. Even his teammates expressed discrimination at times. Many white adults and parents of Paul and protest Terry's inclusion on the team. However, Coach Alfred Smith was firm in his decision on Terry. Despite the constant racism he was against in his career and travels with the team, Terry refused to lead the team because he loved basketball. Through his efforts, Terry became a highly accomplished athlete and was inducted into the Emporia High School Hall of Fame in 1995. Terry was also an excellent student and he aspired to become a teacher himself, but once again, halted by racism. In 1934, Paul Terry enrolled at the Kansas State Teachers College of Emporia and graduated later with his degree in social studies and a minor in geography. At the time, racist policies at the college did not allow Black students to student teach, but merely to observe their white counterparts. This led to Terry having the proper education, but lacking the prerequisites of student teaching. Due to Terry lacking this, no school district would hire him to teach. Terry's case was not out of the ordinary for Black students at the time. Despite the discrimination he faced, Terry led a successful life, just not the one he had originally planned. He served in the military during World War II and was awarded the Bronze Star for his service in bravery. When he came home, he entered into the dry cleaning business, where he worked for 53 successful years. Throughout his years, Terry acted as a leader for the community, advocating for racial equality. Terry's influence was felt across Kansas for his efforts of integration and his dedication to education, leading to several of his own children becoming accomplished athletes and educators. In 1969, he was featured as the Man of the Week in the Emporia Gazette, and in 1973, the Terry family was, no was nominated for the Kansas Kiwas Foundation's Family Builders Award. Paul Terry's name lives on at Emporia State University with the Paul Terry Foundation Scholarship. Webb for School District 90, 1949. This case is another example of the many school integration and desegregation cases that ensued throughout Kansas. In 1947, in Johnson County, Kansas, the new school, South Park Grade School, was built with modern features such as indoor plumbing and brick walls, along with updated resources and supplies for students. Funded through a school bond paid for by the taxes of both black and white residents. However, upon opening, all black children were denied enrollment. These students were left to attend Walker Grade School. This school was a segregated, blacks only, two room schoolhouse encompassing, encompassing eight grades. The building was dilapidated with wooden walls, dirt floors, and no fun. The students had to use outdated and limited resources. This outraged the black community of Johnson County. And with the help of teachers, such as Corinthian Nutter of Walker Grade School, civil rights advocate Esther Brown, and the black attorney, Elijah Scott Sr., 
The parents of the Black students boycotted the district and sued for discrimination and violation of the children's rights to education. School District 90 was sued on the base of the nine Black children admission based on their race and color. The district gave the argument of school zoning in that plans were underway to update Walker, despite no discussion of these plans during the three years after South Park was built. During the boycott trial, the Black teachers at Walker Grade School, Corinthian Nutter and Hazel McRae Weddington, homeschooled the Black children in their living rooms and in church basements. Corinthian Nutter, despite the possibility of ending her teaching career, gave a major testimony to the, to the inequality and clear discrimination the school district allowed. The Kansas Supreme Court ruled in favor of the parents, and, and when the two schools were compared, it was clearly seen that the separate schools were unequal in, in quality, and therefore education for these children. The district was ordered to admit Black children and integrate South Park School. Corinthian Nutter, born December 10, 1906, and passed on February 10, 2004. Corinthia Clay Nutter was a passionate educator and activist for equal education. She started her career by earning a Kansas teaching certificate in 1938. Nutter began working towards a master's degree in education from the Kansas State College of Emporia that same year. She remained an active alum until her death in 2004. Nutter's teaching career began at Walker Elementary School in Merriam, Kansas. Walker was a segregated black only school held in a small, outdated building with inadequate supplies and resources from all eight grade levels. In 1947, the district barred Black students from going to the newly built South Park Elementary, even though its construction was funded by taxes from both the white and Black residents. The parents, local activist Esther Brown, students, and Nutter led a boycott against the school district and filed a lawsuit against them to fight for equality in education. While the boycott and lawsuit commenced, Nutter continued teaching. Unable to meet at the school district facilities, Nutter conducted classes in church basements and living rooms. She did not receive a salary for her efforts until the NAACP intervened. She later would say that she would have continued to teach without pay as long as the students needed her. Nutter's testimony was instrumental in the Webb versus School District 90 decision. The Kansas Supreme Court, Court ruled in 1949 that the Black students could attend South Park Elementary following the case. Following the case, Nutter was offered a position at South Park. However, she opted to accept a position at Westview Elementary School in Olathe, Kansas. During her 22 years at Westview, she advanced from teacher to principal until she retired in 1972. Nutter's courage and impact on others garnered many awards throughout her lifetime. A few notable awards include, but are not limited to, the Distinguished Alumni Award from Emporia State University in 2002, induction into the mid Mid-American Education Hall of Fame in 2003, and her name added to the Rosa Parks Wall of Tolerance in Alabama in 2003. The Webb case was not alone in being a case that challenged segregation. It and many other cases from all over the state and nation culminated into Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, 1954. The Brown versus Board case was a combination of several cases from four states, each of which challenged racial, seg racial segregation in public schools. The courts decided with a unanimous opinion that racial segregation had no place in public education, stated by Supreme Judge Earl Warren. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This was the beginning of the end for de jure segregation or legal segregation, which had been upheld in the Supreme Court nearly 60 years prior. Brown versus the Board of Education showed that racist doctrines could be overturned in the Supreme Court. Although Emporia Public Schools were integrated before Brown versus Board, the impact of the case was felt across the country. This was a major win that opened the, door, opened the doors of education, both as students and as teachers and especially for our following Black, Black Emporian educators. Dr. Thomas Bonner, born September 29, 1921, and passing April 30, 2004. Dr. Thomas Edison Bonner was a dedicated educator with specialty for 
math. His list of degrees includes a bachelor in mathematics from Lincoln University, a master in mathematics from the University of Illinois, and a doctorate in higher education with a specialty in mathematics from Oklahoma State University. University. Dr. Bonner became the first Black faculty member at the, at the Kansas State Teacher College of Emporia when he joined the university in 1960. He taught mathematic classes at both the graduate and the undergraduate levels, including basic general mathematics, trigonometry, calculus, algebra, com complex variables, and differential equations. Dr. Bonner was also an advisor of the Kappa Mu Epsilon Honorary Society and was on the scholarship committee at Emporia State University. Dr. Bonner also brought the historically black fraternity Omega Sci Fi to Emporia's campus. In 1952, Dr. Bonner won the Dr. Christensen, Christensen Award for his script titled A Slight Case of Politics. His legacy lives on at Emporia State University through the Bonner and Bonner Diverse, Diversity Lecture Series, the Mathematics Scholarship Fund the Dr. Thomas E. and Mary W. Bonner Scholarship for Sociology, Anthropology, and Crime and Legal Studies, the Dr. Thomas Edison Bonner and Dr. Mary Winston Bonner Scholarship for Teaching Psychology, and his lasting impression that was left on the students he taught throughout the years, the faculty whom he interacted with, and the town he supported. Dr. Nellie Essex, born April 5th, 1920, and passing January 7, 2008. Nellie Essex was a de dedicated educator in the field of early childhood education. Along with that, she worked in educating the general public and producing future educators through her, through her mentorship efforts. Essex started her journey as a teacher's aide in 1965 at the first Head Start program in Emporia. In this program, she helped teach classes of children ages four to five. Essex went back to college at the age of 50 to earn a master's degree in early education through Emporia State University, followed by a specialist degree in education. Essex was a mentor to many of her younger classmates as well. During her 25 year long career with Head Starts, Essex went from aide to teacher and finally to director of the program. Essex also taught at many elementary schools throughout the Midwest, going as far as Nevada, Oklahoma, and Missouri. Many elementary teachers from the Emporia community recognize her name simply for how great she, how greatly she prepared her students for starting on the right foot for school. She retired in 1990. Nellie lived out her passion for helping children by becoming a school cross guard. She also continued to teach by becoming a historian, and she co-authored the book Black Emporia: An African American Experience Through the Lives of Emporia. Lillian Morrow, born May 28, 1927, and passing on October 11, 2016. Lillian Morrow, with her dedication to child care and education, made herself a known figure of kindness and patience in the Emporia community. She was both an establishing member of and the first Black teacher at the Emporia Community Daycare Center, where she worked for over 20 years. Mara started as a teacher's aide in 1971, when the center was new and small. In her role, Mara did more than just teach. She cooked and served food to the children, she nurtured the children, and she helped the two to three-year-olds successfully reach developmental milestones. As she worked with the kids, she also worked on improving herself and earned a teaching's license. Due to Mara's expertise in early childhood edu education, she frequently taught early childhood and elementary education courses to future preschool and elementary teachers at Emporia State University. Marla had a unique teaching philosophy that included helping kids discover and master their own skill sets and encourage them to learn as much as they could. Marla left a legacy in the community of being a deeply caring and extremely hardworking person. Mara would put in many 12-hour work days and would constantly push back her retirement to ensure that the Emporia Community Daycare Center would succeed. She retired in July of 1990. Dr. Mary Bonner, born April 20th, 1924, and passing in July 18th, 2018. Dr. Mary Winston Bonner was an ambitious and accomplished educator. 
Her degrees include a bachelor degree from St. Paul's College, a master's from Virginia State University, a doctorate in elementary education with a specialty in reading, and minors in social studies and English from Oklahoma State University. And in 1979, her undergraduate college bestowed upon her an honorary doctor of human letters. In 1964, Dr. Bonner became the second Black faculty member at Kansas State Teachers College of Emporia and the first Black woman faculty member. She began as a sixth grade fifth supervising teacher at Butcher Elementary School, then went on to serve in the Department of Curriculum Instruction. Throughout her career, she taught several undergraduate and graduate courses in education, including basic methods in elementary education, reading for the elementary teacher, reading practicum, an introduction to exceptional children and reading for exceptional children. Dr. Bonner also brought the historically, historically Black sorority Sigma Gamma Roy to the Fortis campus. Dr. Bonner achieved much during her lifetime. She received several awards from Emporia State University and the community, such as Emporia State University Certificate for Service of the Faculty Senate in 1983, the Presidential Award for Distinguished Service to Diversity in 2000, along with the Ruth Shellington Award for Extraordinary Contributions to the Women of Emporia State. Her legacy at Emporia State University lives on through the Bonner and Bonner Diversity Lecture Series, the Dr. Thomas E. and Mary Winston Bonner Scholarship for Sociology, Anthropology, and Crime Delinquency Studies, Dr. Thomas Edison Bonner and Dr. Mary Winston Bonner Scholarship for Teaching Psychology, and the lasting impact she made on her students and Emporia throughout her lifetime. The ongoing challenge of equal education. The court decision in Topeka in 1954 was a double-edged sword in the struggle for equal education. Yes, it dropped the bounds for many Black students and educators, yet society still hindered equality. Continuing even after the ruling through the form of de facto segregation, which was not federally mandated, but occurred nonetheless. The basis of this de facto segregation was composed of several factors, including, but not limited to, white flight, redlining and zoning laws, and the establishment of exclusive private schools that remained mostly white. Furthermore, the Brown versus Board decision was a mixed bag for Black teachers because they wanted to see the integration of schools on the moral principle that segregation is wrong. However, the decision resulted in many Black teachers losing their careers, as white parents did not want them teaching their children. Additionally, many historically white schools refused to hire Black teachers, due in part because of racism from school officials and the fear of repercussions from white families. The decade after this decision saw at least 38,000 black teachers lose their jobs. The disparity between the number of white and black teachers continues into today, with only 18% of the national teacher population in 2016 being teachers of color. Ward Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka is a landmark case with the significant changes for the nation. It was neither the beginning nor the end of segregation in the United States, as the battle against racism still continues today. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey of learning. In the description below, we have links to both the interactive timeline and LibGuide that holds even more information and resources about Victoria and Kansas' Black history of education. Thank you once again. Have a happy Black History Month.